It's just wonderful to see the way God's Spirit is moving, and uh, it seems like we've had the baptistry full every other week through the year, and that's what Jesus told us, go, teach, baptize, teach, teaching before, teaching afterward. I'm the teaching afterward this morning. I want to welcome everybody who is here at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church, and I always want to make it a point to welcome those who are watching, some on a phone, a computer screen. Uh, some on a television, some listening to the radio program, and I'm so thankful for our local church family here that uh, is coming out and braving the elements. This is the faithful here to come out on a rainy day like this, and also the thousands that are joining us online. Pray for me as I preach. Um, I'm going to talk about a tough subject today, dealing with perfection. There's a few topics that have been sources of much discussion and debate, even some heated discussions in church life and Christian history, things about Arminianism and Calvinism, you know, once saved, always saved, free will, that's a, been a debate that still goes on today, the nature of God and perfectionism, or how holy do you need to be to be saved, or my sermon title, do you need to be perfect to be saved? I think all of us kind of wonder, Lord, what do I need to do to be saved? And um, we see Jesus, who is such a perfect example, and I think it's fair to say nobody feels like we measure up to Jesus. We wonder, does that mean I'm good enough? We understand being justified by faith, but after you've accepted that, then what? I think sometimes we, we think maybe it would have been easier to be like that thief on the cross where the Lord declares, you will be with me in paradise. And you think, well, I can't make any mistakes now. I'm just going to die with my nails, my hands nailed, you know. And, and so he had no chance to get into any trouble. But it's for those of us that have to live from day to day. How do you live a holy life in a wicked world? And how holy, how perfect do you need to be to be saved? Saw so an interesting program uh, on YouTube this week. It's an old program. It's 2005 from National Geographic. And what they did, by the way, it's called um, Finding the Scientific Adam, or they call him the Super Ancestor. And in this program, what they've done is they've, they've tracked the Y chromosomes of men. You know, only men have Y chromosomes. No matter how you feel, that's still a fact. It's just only men have Y chromosomes. I'm sorry. But uh, they, they see that all men, you can trace the little idiosyncrasies in the Y chromosome and see who's related to who, and they kind of track the migration of people around the world, and they've made some really amazing discoveries. For one thing, they discovered that everybody in the world originates from one of three places, that being Northern Africa, Mesopotamia, or the Middle East, or Asia, meaning maybe Eastern or Western China, and um, which is, you know, the Bible says Middle East. The other thing they discovered is this ancient ancestor that all men are related to happened recently. It wasn't millions of years ago. That's astounding because that's what the Bible teaches. The other thing is they found out this common ancestor, this ultimate super ancestor, the scientific Adam, that when he appears in history, he is sophisticated, speaking a sophisticated language and using complicated tools, not dragging his knuckles, which is what the Bible teaches. Now they still attribute thousands of years beyond what the Bible would say, but it kind of shook them, and they're not done with their research right now. But uh, how many of you know you're all related to Adam? How many know you're all related to Noah? See, I think their study is a little bit misnamed because they're assuming that if you want to find where all men are related, you had to go back to Adam. Actually, you only have to go back to Noah. So this characteristics of the super DNA or the, the chromosomes that they found probably are starting out at Noah. And what does the Bible tell us about the days of Noah? In your Bible, turn to Genesis 6, verse 5. 
after God made man, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man who I've created from the face of the earth. See, after Adam and Eve were made, God made everything good, right? God made everything perfect. Can I have an amen? Some of you are thinking, well, if it was perfect, then how did it go bad? He made it perfect, and they were given a perfect free will. But when Adam and Eve chose to listen to the word of the devil instead of the word of the Lord, something terrible happened to creation. It became con corrupted. It became diseased, and, and something happened within us. God made man originally motivated by love. After sin, the compass needle was broken. Instead of pointing away from self in love for God and love for others, it spun around and it pointed to self. Man became preoccupied with self-worship instead of God-worship. His worship turned inward instead of outward, and that is a self-destructing formula. And every child of Adam and Eve, from that day to this day, we've got this chronic problem with selfishness, sin is what it is. But in spite of the world going bad so quickly, then you read in Genesis 6 verse 9, with this backdrop of every imagination of the thoughts of his heart's only evil continually, it says, but Noah found grace. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Now, that kind of sets the stage for the rest of the Bible in the sense that we're living in a wicked world, but God says you can walk with God and be perfect in your generations. But what do we mean by perfect? That is the question, as Shakespeare would say. Go to the book of Job. In the book of Job, chapter 1, first verse, you don't have to go very far. It says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and hated evil. Perfect man. And then you've got 42 chapters dedicated to this experience of this one perfect upright man who's got three friends that are not so perfect. And his friends are telling him the reason he's going through all these troubles is because there was sin in his life and he said, no, I don't think that's it. I've been following the Lord. He felt rather confident about it. And at the end of the book, the Lord says, Job was right, his friends were wrong. And he tells Job, you better pray for your friends. A holy, upright, perfect man. So you find out that whatever that perfect is, whatever it is Noah had and Job had, it is possible to live a godly life in a wicked world. But it seems like it's pretty rare, which could be discouraging. And the message today... I want to tell you the truth. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. I want to encourage you. Because when we read things like, here it comes, brace for impact. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, at the end of chapter 5, when he's doing the Sermon on the Mount, therefore you shall be perfect. Not just perfect, no confusing. He's saying you be perfect as perfect. Your Father in heaven is perfect. Or be perfect as God. Now, have you ever read that before and just kind of thrown the Bible up in the air and said, I guess I'm done for. How am I ever going to be as perfect as God? As a matter of fact, why don't we get an audience shot here just for the sake of those that are watching. I want to see if my guess is right. How many of you there feel that you're as perfect as God? Yeah. We see your hands, please. So I guess we're all doomed. Some of you still look like you've got joy, and yet you do not believe you're as perfect as God. What does Jesus mean by this? Be therefore perfect. Well, I'm going to get to the answer a little later, so stay with me. For one thing, I think we need to define what does the word perfect mean. Now, in English, 
it's a little different. The word perfect in English means something being completely free from fault or defect, having all the required or desirable elements, qualities, or characteristics, or as close to such condition as possible. Do you ever notice that part of the definition? Completely free from defects, or as close to that as possible. Now, in Greek, the word for perfect, and you got, of course, Hebrew and Greek in the, doing the Old Testament, it's teleos. And that means whole, without blemish, complete, or perfect. In Hebrew, it's the word tam or tamim. And it means to be entire, integrity, truth, without blemish, complete, full, perfect, sincerely or sincerity, sound, without spot, undefiled, upright, whole. Those are the words that it was using for Noah and for Job. Now, the Bible makes it clear. Let's just talk about the standard for perfection. God is perfect. I mean, can you find a better standard to measure by? Who would be the ultimate perfect one? You can read in Psalm 18, verse 30, As for God, His way is perfect. And then Job 37 do you know how the clouds are balanced? Those wondrous works of Him who is perfect in knowledge. God knows everything. If you didn't know everything, you would be incomplete or imperfect in your knowledge. Speaking of Jesus, 1 Peter 2.2.2 2, 2, 2, Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in His mouth. In Hebrews 5.9 and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. He is perfected. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ was offering to trade his perfection for our imperfection. But there's still a lot of questions left. This may be a two-part message. I'll see how far I get. I'll watch your expression and see if I still have you after a few minutes. You know, you can feed a person too much of even the best food, and they can have a food coma. So you, I want to make sure that I'm not giving you too much. Now, prepare for about 15 scriptures here. I told you it's going to be Bible-based. The Bible is clear from cover to cover that we do have a chronic sin problem. How many of you already knew that? Okay, you, you feel it every day. It tells us in Galatians chapter 5, there is an ongoing war between the spirit and the flesh. Between what we know we should be doing, love, and the carnal nature. Romans chapter 3, 23, for how many have sinned? All have sinned except one. Who's that? I already defined who that is. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Genesis 8, 21. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. There is something evil in our natures. Job 5, 7. Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. It's almost you know, just, you know, you throw wood in the fire, the sparks don't go down, they go up. With the heat, heat rises. 1 Kings 8.46. By the way, this identical verse is in 2 Chronicles 6.36. Solomon is dedicating the temple. And he's talking about people praying to the temple. And he said, when they sin against you. You notice he didn't say if. He said, when they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. Psalm 90 verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sin, in the light of your presence. Psalm 40, verse 12. Mine iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head. Therefore my heart fails me. Psalm 130, verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. That's our hope, amen? That you may be feared. Psalm 143, verse 2, Do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no one living is righteous. That's pretty comprehensive, I think. Proverbs 20, verse 6, and verse 9, But who can find a faithful man? 
Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Well, we just did a survey here and didn't find anybody. Ecclesiastes 7.20 For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Now, I'm not giving you all the scriptures, but the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, pretty clear that people have a sin problem. The question is, can we overcome it? Romans 3, 9 through 12. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. He's talking about these people in the Old Testament. For we have previous, previously charged both Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, <clears throat> quoting now from the Old Testament, there is none, by the way, this is Psalm 14 among others, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. That also sounds pretty comprehensive. James 3, 2 and 3, for we all stumble in many things. And then Galatians 3, 22. But the scripture has confirmed all, I'm sorry, confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So we've got this issue in our nature and we see it even among little children that as soon as you tell them, here's the boundary, and they'll look at you and they put their foot over it. And you say, whatever you do, don't stick anything in the outlet. And they look at you and they take the screwdriver and they just want to see what's going to happen. It's like the mother who told her son strictly not to go swimming after school. And she said, why did you disobey me? He said, I got tempted. She said, why did you take your bathing suit to school? He said, I knew I'd be tempted. <laughs> so we've, we've got this this bent, this chronic problem in our natures with sin. But God is calling us to holiness. But how perfect do we need to be? Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. All right, first of all, it's established that I think most Christians agree that it doesn't matter what your sins are. When you come to Jesus, he covers you with his robe of righteousness he embraces you just as I am without one plea except your blood was shed for me. It's not based on any works that I have done. We are justified freely by his grace. Can you say amen? amen. I was telling Karen that you did a good job that time, but there are other times you don't do so well. And I, I thought about getting a little electronic button. So one of the guys in our office, he's got a button, and when you ask something he doesn't want to do, he presses the button. It says, I can't do that. Don't bother me. I'm busy. And I want to get an amen button. And I'll give it to two or three people on the front row. And when I look at them, they're going to go, hey, Amen. <laughs> or maybe I could just look at you. <laughs> See what happens. So we're justified. We agree with that. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Notice, we're justified those who are being sanctified. Now, I remember when I first started going to church and I heard the pastors using these big words you don't use in everyday speech of justification and sanctification and glorification and, and I wondered what does that all mean. So just for the record, justification means you come to the Lord by faith, you confess your sins, you repent of your sins, He embraces you, forgives you, gives you a gift of perfection. Your record is now clean as though you have never sinned. Okay. That takes care of past sin. Now what do I do today for the rest of the time and tomorrow as I'm tempted? That's now entering the process of sanctification. Learning to be a saint is sanctification. Notice the word process. You'll find where Isaiah says, learn to do good, cease to do evil. There's learning involved in that. That means like as a baby learning to walk, they're probably going to fall. A minute ago we quoted that verse in Romans. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, does that mean everybody who ever lived sinned? John the Baptist, the greatest of the prophets, did he sin? He said, Jesus, you need to be baptizing me. And yet Jesus said, he is the greatest of the prophets. And Joseph, 
And Daniel, while he, Daniel says, while I was confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel. I mean, these are godly people. And if you have a baby next month, first of all, I hope you know it's coming. But if you have a baby next month, is that baby going to sin? Is there any excuse for sin? No, it, you know, first of all, when you say, is a baby going to sin? Well, before the age of accountability, it's not held to them. They have no record of guilt. Are we clear? But does that baby have a selfish nature? Baby's about the most selfish thing in the world. I mean, all it thinks about, it, it's not thinking about, oh, I didn't mean to wake you up. You tired? I'll cry later. They don't care. If you, you just, all they think about is, I am hungry, I have a plumbing problem, I am bored, I'm going to cry until I get some attention in one way or the other. All they're thinking about is me, 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 right? They have to learn to love. Some never outgrow it, which is really frightening. Romans chapter 5, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus our Lord through whom also we have access by faith unto this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So after being justified by faith, God wants us to live lives of rejoicing. Now one reason I'm preaching this message is because I meet a lot of unhappy Christians and when you drill down and wonder why are they so unhappy, they doubt their salvation. They doubt they're going to make it. And they're not happy and they're not bringing anyone to the Lord because no one wants their faith because it hasn't helped them. So if Christians are going to be good witnesses and we want our church to be a witnessing church, then we need to have the joy of the Lord. And you would be a lot happier if you had more confidence that you're going to make it. You'd be thinking more about heaven, talking more about heaven and wanting to bring people with you. But if we're always going around looking sour and doubtful, you're not going to win anybody. Paul says they should have joy. We stand and rejoice in this hope. Now Jesus is the only one who has never sinned. All others have sinned. So where do we go from here? The Bible tells us very clearly God has called us to lives of holiness. Genesis 17.1, God says to Abraham, and this is uh, verse 1, chapter 17. And when Abram was 90 years old, 90 years old and 9, 99, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Deuteronomy 18, 13. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Friends, don't take this up with me. I'm just reading you what Jesus said, what God says, Okay. Psalm 37, 37. Mark the perfect man and behold the upright man for the end of that man is peace. Well, I want peace. What is this perfection? 2 Peter 3, 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. There's that peace again, but he says without spot, perfect, upright. How do we get there? I don't think I've arrived, but you know, I'm in good company. Paul says, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but I press on. You may not get to the place where you feel like you're good enough. Matter of fact, I try to avoid people that think they're perfect. Have you met them? No one raised their hand in church today, thank heavens. But some of you are thinking, is this a trick question? I want to be the only one here that's right. And you're, you wanted to <laughs> raise your hand. Because you're thinking perfectly justified, that would have been okay. But I've met people who think, I have arrived. And they say, I'm sinless. And they didn't just mean through justification, they meant, I don't sin anymore. And as soon as I began to debate with them, they got angry at me. <laughs> and I felt some gratification, which probably wasn't right, <laughs> that I proved they weren't perfect. <laughs> But God says he's calling us to perfection. Notice in the Bible, the reason the Bible is full of stories is the characters, the heroes in the Bible, we see they are flawed. One reason that I love the Bible and believe the Bible is because it's a for real book. If the Bible was written like some novels today, it always has the hero flawless. 
I just got done reading a historical story about uh, William Barents who did this expedition up, I like reading history books, made the expedition up to uh, Nova Zempa, trying to go around from Europe to China, going through the North Pole. They found out, of course, they can't do it. And after his third attempt, he died. But as I'm reading the author, he couldn't say anything wrong about uh, Barrett's. And I thought, you're kind of, you're uh, not giving complete history here. You're making him out to be a hero and you're not talking about any of his flaws. There must have been something in his letters or the record, but you're just, you're glowing. You're inflating him beyond reality. It's like the little girl who did the book report on Abraham Lincoln and she wanted to impress her class. And she said, Abraham Lincoln was born at an early age in a log cabin that he built with his own hands. <laughs> and you know, these human historians, it gets bigger than life. But the Bible tells about the flaws. For example, speaking in the New Testament of Zechariah and Elizabeth, it says, they were both, Luke 1 verse 6, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. How many of you would like that? To have the Lord accuse you of that. But then you read in the same chapter, the angel says, but behold, you're going to be mute and not be able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my word. Well, he had a faith issue there, right? But he's called blameless because the tenor of his life was one of surrender and obedience. He was committed to following God. It didn't mean he never had his moments. This is, this is really fantastic. The apostles, you know them? John chapter 17. I want you to read it because you may not believe it's here. I'm also putting it on the screen here. In his dedicatory prayer, in Jesus' intercessory prayer in John 17, he says to the Father, speaking of the 12 apostles, you can read the context for yourself, they were yours, you gave them to me, they have kept your word. They have kept your word. Now let me tell you what happens within 24 or 48 hours of that statement. Um, they were arguing among themselves which of them was the greatest, refusing to wash one another's feet. They fell asleep when Jesus told them to pray. Then they pull out swords to commit murder in the name of the Lord when they wake up. Then they abandon the Lord. Then Peter denies even knowing him with swearing and cursing. Then when he does rise from the dead, they doubt it's true and they still misunderstand the nature of his kingdom. And Jesus said concerning the apostles, you are going to sit on 12 thrones in heaven judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Are they going to make it? Well, we all know about Judas. Hope there's no Judases here. But these are the ones. Why? They followed Jesus. They didn't when the others turned away. You ever read the gospel? In, it's interesting, the verse. It's John 6, 6, 6. John chapter 6, verse 66. It says that they forsook him. Many forsook him. And Jesus said to the disciples, will you also forsake me? They said, Lord, where are we going to go? You've got the words of life. They were committed to Jesus. They believed his word. And yeah, they had issues. Not only then, but even after Pentecost, you can see Paul had to chastise Peter because he said, you're being a hypocrite. You're trying to act a little more religious when the Jews come to visit from Jerusalem. But as soon as they leave, you hang out with the Gentiles. And uh, he was right. Uh, selfishness is going to be a battle until there's no devil. We are going to battle the flesh until Jesus comes. But you can have the joy of the Lord. He who began a good work in you will finish it if you stay with Jesus. Jesus will never let go of you. That's his promise. You can let go of him, but he will never let go of you. If you run from him, it will be your choice. This is where we're different from, you know, people that believe once saved, always saved. God does not take away your freedom. And I've used this illustration before, but some haven't heard it. So Karen and I got married. We made a covenant to love each other, forsaking all others, sickness and health. And I 
I trust she's going to keep her covenant. I'm keeping mine. So far, so good. <laughs> 33 years. I do not worry that she's not going to. She, I don't believe, worries about me. <laughs> Just giving her a moment to testify if she had something she wanted to share. You know, at the weddings, it, there's that awkward moment where the pastor used to say, now, if there's anybody here who for any reason... <laughs> They don't do that anymore, do they? <laughs> but does she still have freedom if she wants to? And I have that freedom. But we have love. When you have love and you have trust, you have peace. And you can have that in your relationship with Jesus. He wants you to. If you continue to just say, Lord, I fell. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Now, do we have arguments? Yes, you heard it. For those listening at home, if you didn't hear that, it came from the peanut gallery. <laughs> yeah, you, you're going to have... But there's a commitment of love and a commitment that you're going to finish what you started, right? Jesus said he's going to make that promise. And you can make that promise. And as long as you do not take your hand out of his hand. Now, but how holy do I need to be? It says, Mark the perfect man, the upright man, the end of that man is peace. Uh, Patrick Morley writes in his book, I Surrender, that the church's integrity problem is in the misconception that we can add Christ to our lives but not subtract sin. We must turn from sin. It's a change in belief without a change in behavior. There must be a change. It is a revival without reformation, without repentance. People want happiness and they don't want holiness. And so it's a deadly error to believe that all you need to do is say, I love the Lord and you can continue living a life of sin. There are some verses in the Bible that are pretty clear on that subject. Jesus said to the apostles, you who have followed me, that's not Judas, is it? Will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He said to the Father, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one. You know, the closer we get to the Lord as Christians, the closer we get to each other. But when you come into the light of God's glory, you're not going to feel perfect. In fact, the closer you come to the Lord, the more imperfection you will be aware of. Do not be discouraged. This is normal. Isaiah chapter 5, when Isaiah, godly man, prophet of God, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, he sees a picture of God in his glory, and what does he do? This is Isaiah chapter 6. He says, woe is me, I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king. In the contrast of God on his throne, in his holiness, and the angels there, the seraphim crying, holy, 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 and they're covering their faces and they're covering their feet. The holiness and the purity and the majesty of God and the building is shaking. Isaiah is overwhelmed with his sinfulness. When you come into the light of God, as you get closer to the light, the more the imperfections become distinct. You know, before I come out to preach, um, They've got a green room where I kind of gussy up a little bit as much as I can. I want to make sure when I come out here and they're taping, there's no glaring problems. I, I'm working with what I got, you understand. <laughs> because I have made the mistake before of walking from the shadows out on the stage with TV lights. I remember once I met an old friend in the lobby and between Sabbath school and church and gave her a big hug and then went out to preach and I forgot she had about 20 cats. And I had a dark suit. And I walked out in the light and I looked down. It looked like I'd been wrestling with a sheep. I, had all, I thought, ooh, I thought I was okay until I got into the light. I remember when we did the Net New York program. They had a dark dressing room. It was actually a hotel room that was adjoining the stage. And I was late and I raced and I put on my suit that was hanging in the closet. And I went out on the stage and Karen looks at me and she, she kind of snickers because I had the pants from one suit and the jacket from another. I didn't realize it because they were kind of both dark. And so now if you want to know what that looks like, it's still on tape. <laughs> when you come into the light, 
<laughs> getting dressed this morning, I knew I was going to be talking about perfection. And so I said, Karen, does this tie match your shirt? I said, I've got to look good today. I'm going to be talking about perfection. I might be scrutinized. But I think we all know, you know, we're human. And in the same way you want the grace of God, you want to share that grace with others. Amen? But we're commanded to obey. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? We've cast out devils in your name, and in your name we've done many wonderful works. And I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We need to know the Lord. We need to follow the Lord. And it's not just saying, Lord, Lord, we need to be willing to obey the Lord. If you fail, do not be discouraged. A righteous man falls seven times and rises again. If you fail and it doesn't bother you, that is a problem. You should feel conviction when you sin. And then you repent and he forgives you. And because it's no fun to feel conviction, you pray that God will give you more consistency. What about where it says in 1 John 3, 6, Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. This used to really trouble me. And it still gives me the right amount of conviction. It's saying that those who abide in Christ do not practice a life of sin. It's not talking about the occasional good deed or misdeed. By the way, I'm quoting here from that classic Steps to Christ. You know the book. You look on page 57. The character is revealed not by the occasional good deeds or occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and acts. John is saying, whoever abides in him does not practice a life of sin. That's why before persons baptized, they need to be turning away. People say, Pastor Doug, can I just quit smoking after I, I get baptized? They say, no. Nope. So what does that do to your testimony? You go to your friends and you say, praise God, Jesus set me free. He broke the chains. I'm now his. And then you blow smoke in their face. So you, gotta, you, you don't want to be practicing a life of sin. There needs to be repentance and reformation. Amen? God is calling us to holiness. He says, be holy, for I am holy. Well, how do we do that? Well, he gives us a lot of promises for victory. 2 Peter 1 verse 4 by which have given to us, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, not just promises, but exceeding promises, not just exceeding, but exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these, through these promises in God's word, you might be partakers of the divine nature. You know what a Christian is? Simply, a follower of Christ. God wants us to be Christ-like. When we love Jesus, we want to be like Jesus. Amen? And so when Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, what is he talking about? Perfect love. You know, what throws people is they don't read the whole thing. If you go with me, for example, go to Matthew 5. I want to show you something. You have to go there. I can't, I'm not going to just read that one verse. There in Matthew 5, 48, it says, Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What happens when you read a verse out of context? You get mixed up. You got to find out what is Jesus talking about? Go to verse, well, the whole chapter you could say. You've heard it said in verse 38, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist a person. Someone slaps you in one cheek, offer him the other. That's pretty radical, but he's saying, forgive people. If someone wants to sue you to take away your tunic, give him your cloak. He's saying, love people. Overcome evil with good. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go two. Give to him who asks of you, who wants to borrow, do not turn him away. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do you only love those who love you? If you only greet your brethren, how are you better? After talking about loving each other, it's all about horizontal love here. You got me? He says, therefore, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, how do I know that's what he's talking about? In the same passage in Luke, and you can look it up, Luke 6, 36, he says, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. He's talking about loving others, 
being merciful to others, forgiving others. He wants us to have that perfect as your Father in heaven loves you and has mercy on you. You realize Jesus said, forgive as you are forgiven, right? That's what Jesus is saying when he says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. He means be perfectly merciful because if you do not forgive your brethren, it's in the Lord's prayer, if you do not forgive your brethren their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Yes, it's true. He wants us to learn to love each other. How can you say you love God who you have not seen if you cannot love your brother who you do see? Amen? He's calling us to lives of obedience. Now, every day there's a battle. Every day I've got to say, Lord, not I but Christ. I take up my cross, deny myself. That's just the selfishness that gets me in trouble. And many times a day, deny myself. I have no problem thinking about myself. I have problems loving others. And we learn sanctification. We learn to love others. And if you say, Lord, give me more love for my neighbor, you know what God's going to do to you? He's going to have your neighbor test your love. <laughs> Lord, help me love my children more. Boy, I, the Lord sends us children to teach us love. Amen? And patience. It's also how, why he gets us involved in marrying people who are opposites. God's cosmic sense of humor. To teach us love. He wants us to have perfect love. If you love God more, you obey Him better. Didn't Jesus say, if you love me, do what? Amen. Trying to keep God's commandments without love is a tempting and impossibility. Those people are miserable and they make everyone else miserable. But if you love the Lord, you know where our biggest battle is in living the Christian life in Christian perfection? Increasing our love for God. Because the more you love Him, the more you're going to love your neighbor because God loves them the more you're going to love the Lord, the more you're going to want to obey Him and please Him. You don't want to hurt people that you love. And when you see how much Jesus loves us by looking at the cross, then it makes us love Him more. All things are possible. See, friends, when we, when we believe that the devil can tempt us, how many agree that we know the devil can tempt us? but we don't believe Jesus can keep us from sin. What you're saying is your devil is bigger than your God. Can you name a sin for me that someone has never been able to get the victory over? I mean, I'm talking about practical sins, not the unpardonable sin. Have people been able to get the victory over alcohol, drugs, unforgiveness, um, you name it. Anything you can think of. I know people who have gotten the victory over those things. That means you can because all things are possible with God. He's calling us to lives of holiness. Will it happen in one day? I spent my first 17 years of my life learning to sin. Uh, and then God says, be ye holy. Well, give me a minute, Lord. I'm going to have to work on this. And he then teaches you through keeping your eyes on Jesus, you become like the one you look at. You will become like who you look at. I remember years ago, and, and um, <laughs> been here so long, I can't remember anymore what I shared with you and what I haven't, but with the first litter of kids, Rachel, Micah, Daniel, were visiting Grandpa in Florida. I flew home just with the three kids to go up to our home in Covalo this time of year. It was after Christmas vacation. And it snowed, big snow, like 18 inches of snow. And I'm driving my Nissan four-wheel drive pickup truck up the road. And we're wearing clothing from Florida. We've just been in Florida. And those of you who know, the house is 12 miles back on dirt roads, no electricity back there, which is way out, very remote. And as I'm driving up the road, now I, I was young and not as experienced back then. I'm driving up the road. I'm thinking four-wheel drive. wonder how far I can go. And I thought to myself, well, if I get stuck, I'll turn around and I, I'll go stay at Dr. Simpson's house. Kids said, oh, let's go home. We can make it. We're doing fine. We got four-wheel drive. They wanted so much to get hold. And they're like, you know, they're like uh, 11, 9, and uh, 8 years old. And I said, all right. 
And we went, got within two miles, and then the truck got high-centered, which means no matter what I did, there was no way it would go. I, I had nothing to dig it out with. I'm wearing not enough clothing. It's snowing now. The flakes are coming down. Great big heavy snowflakes are coming down. We stepped out, and as I went up higher, the snow got deeper. It's almost like two feet. I'm surprised I got so far. There's nothing nearby I can hook a winch to to pull the truck out. We are stuck. So I said, well, guys, I think I got enough gas. We can sit here until morning, and I can try and hike off and try and get some help. And they said, no, Dad, we can go home. They wanted so much to get home. And I said, are you sure? I said, well, you're going to get cold. Well, we'll be all right. I said, I know. Don't tell me. I know it was stupid. <laughs> but, you know, what took 15 minutes in the truck takes a lot longer walking and longer still if you're walking through two feet of snow. So we took off, and we were all warm in the truck, and we felt good at first, and it was kind of fun, and they're throwing snowballs, and we're hiking, and, we're, and the, the snow continued to get deeper. And if you're walking through deep snow, you're having to... You, know, you, you can't just kick your feet forward. You've got to lift your feet up or it's just too much work. And so you start going like this for a long time and I started getting tired. And now I'm like halfway there and I have to stop and rest. The kids, they were making it by putting their feet in my feet. <laughs> and finally, then we were going under these trees that had snow on them. We'd bump the tree and all the snow of the tree on the road would fall down on you as we're getting cold and we're wet and covered with snow and the kids were wearing tennis shoes when the tennis shoes got wet every time they put their foot down sometimes the snow has got the consistency where it's make a snowball it's really great you know a snowball keeps rolling getting bigger they pick up their foot and it was like a snowball it kept getting bigger and they put it down they pick up more snow and they're having trouble picking up their feet and they kind of knock the snow off their feet and they're getting really tired and now it's like 2 in the morning because we drove up from San Francisco. We've been flying all day. And we all just got hit with exhaustion. And Daniel sat down and said, I can't go anymore. I said, I can't stay here. And I'm thinking, I can't go anymore, but I can't leave them. And it got so bad, friends, I'm not kidding you. We were starting to fear for our lives. We were closer to home than back to the truck. And I thought, our best chance is to try to get to the house. And I got so tired that... And I didn't want my kids to die, but I had to keep on going. I would literally stand up. I would fall down in the snow, make an impression, stand up, take two feet, fall down in the snow. And the kids were coming after me like, you know, little bears following their mother. It was wonderful to hear them encourage each other because they realized it's getting desperate. Finally, when I... <laughs> I knew I was getting near the house, and I was so cold, and I couldn't feel my fingers, I couldn't feel my feet, I felt like, here, I've killed my kids. I started shouting for the dogs. I thought, if the dogs come, they'll make a trail in the snow. It'll make it easier. And, yeah, I haven't relived this in a while. <laughs> I started shouting, and you know, the snow muffles your sound. So I'm shouting for the dogs, I'm shouting. I thought, you know, when are they going to come? And finally they heard me because the snow muffled that they didn't hear me. And they all came jumping, leaping, bounding through the snow and they were so happy to see us. And just that little bit made a difference. Where, and we started going downhill at that point. We could make our way to the house. We got inside and it was so nice. You know how they made it? They followed in my steps. And, you know, Jesus came into this world to leave us a path. And he doesn't want to leave you behind. And if you follow in his steps, you can make it. You can be whatever it is you need to be. I just know that there is a whole arena full of people that are going to be there that made it. That means you can make it. His sacrifice was adequate enough for you to make it. You can be whatever you call perfection. You can be that. All things are possible with God. You just got to keep putting your feet in his steps that he's made, that blood-stained path that Jesus has made for you. How many of you want to be like your Lord? We're going to sing about it. Let's stand together. We're going to sing Be Like Jesus, 311 in our hymnal.